Synthesis of alcohols by reduction of a carbonyl. Now this carbonyl might be an aldehyde, a ketone, a carboxylic acid, or an ester. The carbonyl is the C double bond O. So what do we mean by reduction? Reduction means a decrease in oxidation number. So let's review how to find oxidation number. Finding the oxidation number is similar to finding formal charge. So here's a carbon with three bonding pairs and a lone pair. And when we're doing formal charge, we're in the covalent limit. The covalent limit means 100% electron sharing. Since each bond consists of a pair of electrons, and each atom gets half of its bonding electrons, it's useful to draw a box around the atom that cuts the bonds exactly in half. And then you can think of there being one electron inside the box and one electron outside the box for each bond. Note that both of the non-bonding electrons, the lone pair, are inside the box. And then we compare that with what a carbon atom should have. Carbon normally has four valence electrons, so we take four and we subtract the number of electrons in the box, which is five, and we get negative one. Right, so the formal charge on the carbon is negative one, and it is a carbanion. And we draw that with a minus with a, um, a circle around it. With oxidation number, we are no longer saying we're in the covalent limit. Instead, oxidation number artificially imposes the limit of ionic bonding. That is, that means the more electronegative atom gets 100% of its bonding electrons. And so we have to consider the other atoms that it's bonded to so we can decide which is more electronegative. So now we're considering each bond. Consider the bond between carbon and carbon. There is no electronegativity difference so that one is shared 50%. Each carbon gets one of those bonding electrons. Between carbon and oxygen, however, the oxygen is more electronegative, so carbon gets none of those bonding electrons. Between carbon and hydrogen, carbon is more electronegative, so it gets all of the bonding electrons, and hydrogen gets none. And of course, you still include the non-bonding electrons, So now when we find the oxidation number, we're using the number of electrons that carbon should normally have, four, and we're subtracting the number of electrons in the box. And now it is one, two for the lone pair, three for the CC bond, and two more for the CH bond. So two, three, four, five. Four minus five equals negative one. This is a rare scenario where the formal charge equals the oxidation number. But what if we changed that hydrogen to another carbon? So now when we draw our box around carbon, two of the bonds are to other carbons, so we bisect them like this. And then of course carbon gets both of its non-bonding electrons and none of the CO bonding electrons. So now when we go to find our oxidation number, it's four minus, let's see here, one, two, three, four. So that's an oxidation number of zero, despite the fact that the formal charge is negative one. What about finding the oxidation number on a different atom, like nitrogen? Well, you still have to draw the box. Nitrogen's more electronegative than hydrogen, so it gets both of those electrons, but it's also more electronegative than carbon, so it gets both of those, but it is less electronegative than oxygen, so it, only, so it gets zero of those. And now, when we find the oxidation number, nitrogen should have five, so it's five minus two, four, six. 
that's negative 1, despite the fact that this is actually a neutral nitrogen according to formal charge. Here's a series um, going from methane to carbon dioxide. The carbon in methane has an oxidation number of minus 4. That is the most reduced. And carbon dioxide is plus 4. That is the most oxidized. Can you verify the oxidation numbers that are displayed here in the green boxes? Pause your video and try working them out. Hopefully you got the same answers as me. Try this. What's the oxidation number of the carboxyl carbon in acetic acid? We're talking about that carbon. Pause the video while you work. Okay, hopefully you're ready. Inside the box for that carbon, there is only one electron. So we have 4 minus, I'm sorry, 1 equals plus 3 for the oxidation number. Remember, the less electronegative atom gets none of the bonding electrons, which is why carbon sees none of the electrons from the oxygens. But between a carbon and carbon, this bond here, you have to share the electrons 50-50. That's why there's one electron inside carbon's box there. So if we take a carbonyl and we replace one of the pi bonds with bonds to two hydrogens, we get reduction and we make an alcohol. And when we're talking about reduction, we're talking about the oxidation number on the alpha carbon going down. So let's calculate those oxidation numbers. Inside the box for this carbon, we've got half of the CC bonding electrons. So we got 4 minus 2 equals 2. Write a positive oxidation number there. Before you try to calculate the oxidation number for the isopropanol, draw in the extra bond. Okay, and now we cut that bond in half and we cut that in half, but we get all of that one and we get none of that one. So inside the box we've got one, two, three, four electrons. And so four minus four is zero. We've gone from plus two to zero, that's a reduction. So what sorts of reducing agents might we use to go from a carbonyl to an alcohol? Well, something that gives you a very good yield is catalytic hydrogenation. Write H2 with PD or PT or nickel. And we go from the C double bondo to the C single bondo H. Right, 95% yield. The problem with catalytic hydrogenation is that it's not selective. It'll reduce any pi bond in your molecule. So for instance, if you take this molecule that's both an alkene and a ketone, and you subject it to catalytic hydrogenation, you end up with just a plain old 2-pentanol. All of the pi bonds were reduced. What if we just wanted to reduce the carbonyl, but we wanted to leave the CC double bond alone? What reagents could we use here? 
We need something that preferentially reduces the carbonyl, but doesn't go after CC double bonds. To make this happen, we need a nucleophilic hydride. To be nucleophilic, you've got to be polarizable. A plain old hydride ion, that's just a hydrogen with two electrons, this is not polarizable because that hydrogen 1s orbital is so small and not easily deformed. So what we really need is something that can supply a hydride but has a more polarizable electron cloud. Consider sodium borohydride. Now the electron cloud is um, a molecular orbital based on boron, more easily deformed than just a hydrogen 1s orbital. And now it's capable of performing nucleophilic attack.